When I prepare this video, I ask some of my friends what do they think when they first see my title. Most of them say they heard of what is machine learning, it is very popular nowadays. Some of them ask what is PS wave separation, and many of them just not noticing the VSP as it is too far away from them. Let me give you a first impression of PNS waves from a wider view. It's definitely not the first time you heard about earthquake. When big earthquake comes, things around you begin to shake. Roots may fall, communications break down, lots of damages occur. This all directly starts from the quake of the earth. The quake seems like the wave you see in water, lake, and ocean. However, it has something different traveling through the solid earth. You see our earth being cut off in the center of your screen. The wave of earthquake can be simulated under the simplified physical assumptions. This is a demo of how earthquake traveling around the Earth, produced by Iris. If you look closer, you will spot that there is a red curve and blue curve traveling around the Earth in the center. And the seismogram is labeled also by this color. The red one travels faster, is what they labeled as P wave, and the blue one travels a little bit slower, is S wave. Rationalized PNS wave is very important work in seismology. We work on PNS waves, though not the seismograms of this kind. There's a bunch of people inspired from earthquake. They use artificial sources to generate elastic waves. The waves travel through the subsurface of Earth and received by receiving instruments such as geophone and hydrophone. We call these waves seismic waves. The figures you see here are diagrams on how seismic surveys are exploited onshore and offshore. This artificial south seismic survey is a significant tool to explore the resources on the ground. As you know, gas, oil, water, and so on. So how does seismic waves function? How can seismic waves help us discover the Earth? Well, signals talk. A better way to understand complex thing is to decompose it and understand every part of it. Remember the peak of PNS with in seismograms from earthquake? When it comes to seismic surveys, the density of signals increase. These seismograms need even delicate analysis. PNS waves are not only required to be recognized in vision and pick up in time, but desperate for being separated into single mode seismograms. Then, let's jump right into the data I face every day. Can you figure out which part of them is P wave and which part is S wave? Maybe a little bit hard right now. You even want to ask, how come they look different even with the seismograms you showed us before? Well, because these files, named the vertical seismic profile, are from a different acquisition system. Here, you drill a borehole deep down to the earth. The depth of it usually from meters to several kilometers. Receiving instruments such as geophones are set near the walls of borehole. When you generate an artificial sound on the ground, the signals will be received by the sensors in a borehole with the time going. It's just in this case, what you see here are not the data recorded in real field survey, but what we simulated by computers. This is a two-component vertical seismic profile. Two-component, you get it obviously that the two seismograms show in front of you. One is the vertical component, receives vertical particle motions. And the another is the horizontal component, correspondingly receives horizontal particle motions. What does particle motion link with PNS waves? Here we borrow diagrams from Michigan's tag to illustrate. This describes the relationship of direction of propagation and the direction of particle motions on four different kinds of waves. We have the direction of propagation all the same as the long red arrows. The small black box highlights the particle motions. Let's focus on the difference of PNS waves. Pure P wave has its direction of particle motion parallel to the direction of propagation while pure S wave has its direction of particle motion 
perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Most of the situation is that the main propagating direction of P and S waves are almost parallel. That makes the two components have constructive proportion of P and S waves. You see most of P waves are in vertical component for this case, and most of S waves can be seen in horizontal component. This leads to a group of wave separation method that separate waves from single component of seismic data. Not only use uh, motion features of waves, but other discrepancies such as difference of velocity between PS waves. And unfortunately, these are based on the approximation that PS waves travel nearly parallel. Signals would be ignored or even worse, being classified wrongly if they not obey to this assumption. We really need more accurate separation. As the separation methods grow, more vector or tensor-based methods come up. They can fully utilize all components of the signals. This kind of method is mainly based on the mathematical and physical theory that P wave can be derived by calculating the divergence of the elastic waves. And S wave can be derived by calculating curl of elastic waves. However, this method cannot be used on recording data directly. But why? Let's make clear about the current situation. We have an equation to simulate the seismic waves. We have mathematical method to separate P and S waves in their propagated space during their propagation. If we record sufficient signals cover the whole space of the research area, we could do the separation just like what we described. But the reality is we cannot record all of the signals from their whole propagated space. We can only record where we set geophones. While divergence and curl calculation really rely on vectors or tensors in space, such that we cannot perfectly derive P and S wave by this mathematical method directly. That is to say, the vector-based separation method used in recorded data have the following limits. 1. Not complete signals cover their whole propagated space. And 2. Not accurate information of their propagated space. That is a characteristic of subsurface. If we conclude this separation problem like that, it seems rather appropriate to have a learning-based solution. What can we do? We compose many different combinations of possible characteristics of subsurface. This free us from a very accurate underground information. And we do the wave propagation, derive P as wave from Helmholtz decomposition. This helps us to see signals from whole propagated space to do the separation. We then build up suitable machine learning tools. Here we use deep convolutional neural network. We let the neural network to learn from the data that separates P PS waves from seismograms. When the network is trained well, it has ability to separate PS waves from seismograms that share similar distributions. Now, let me show you the detailed approaches we used and how our result goes. Actually, we are trying to make this idea come true step by step. I will quickly go through the formal two experiments we did, summarize how these experiments lead us to our latest work. OK, the first experiment. We tried to separate not the two kind of waves, but only P waves out from one component synthetic data. We made lots of subsurface models. Here is finger present one of the characteristics to show the difference of this subsurface model. This one is P wave velocity. And this model you see here has four flat layer. We modify the number of layers, the value of velocities, and the source positions. Then apply wave propagator and the vector-based wave separator to the model and generate seismograms like shown here uh, with the number of data set over 22,000. We use part of this data training and testing through our neural network. The network shows its ability to learn wave separation. And we make further tests on more complex subsurface model. Just like what I show you here, it owns small layers, even inclined layers rather than flat layers. The network trained on flat layers can still separate these waves as what we want. 
Then the second experiment, instead of extracting P waves only from the single component, we tried from multi components. We use open synthetic data from SEG. The subsurface model has more colorful structure in it, and the data different from the huge volume of training data sets. In this case, we set only one independent variable in the data set, that is the source position. Each source contributes to one piece of data. We have 151 shots of data in total, and one third of them are used for training. What does one piece of data look like? You can feel it in either of the gray figures on the right. The one on the top is our target separated PVFs. And at the bottom is our result, predicted by well-trained neural network. Detailed comparison also presents the difference is just as subtle as we feel between the Greek figures of the results. And thanks to the small volume of data, we have chance to work on how the choosing of training datasets influence the testing results. We sample the location of sources from the whole datasets with different sampling rate. And each red line on plotting stands for one testing results after training on different choice of sources. The x axis is the position of the source, and the y axis is the testing score. Score higher, the separation results better. It is very obvious which ones are included in the training datasets. These are the high scores. From the contrast, we get that as we decrease the sample interval of training dataset, the testing results get better in wave separation. By the way, we named the method that sampling the dataset for training as a interpolated based learning. Because this situation is rather common seen in geophysical training strategy, and we will recall it in our following experiments. Then, finally, we come to separate both P and S waves simultaneously from multi component seismic data. This time, we still use synthetic seismic data, while in the meantime, we think how does our neural network show its ability to separate waves in real seismic survey? So, we make this problem a target oriented work. Now we have a target dataset to separate. Imagine this data from this subsurface model. Well, indeed, the chapters of subsurface is unknown. What we got are some approximating velocity models. The model from geological survey, models derived from surface seismic investigation, and model from analysis near offset VSP first arrivals. None of them are 100% correct velocities, even though our method does not fear it. We have benefits to make the data tolerant the errors in the velocity model. How? If you remember the first experiment we make to change the position of layers and the value of velocity, for this time, we come up with a new data building strategy that can not only involve the variables of subsurface model, but dramatically saves our computational cost. Instead of changing velocity model, we change the synthetic data acquisition geometry, just like I'm about to show you here. Now, focus on the upcoming right and blue part of this diagram. Let's have a close look at our training data building strategy. First, see the acquisition system of our target data sets. Red triangles below the red dash line presents the distribution of sources, and the vertical blue dash points out the position of borehole where C tower receivers. Based on target data set, we built our training data set with two steps. One, sampling the number of sources. It is an efficient way for choosing training data set we learn from our interpolated based learning strategy. Two, adding more receivers. And because these receivers have different surrounding velocity. We involve the variables of velocity potentially, and we also get more training data sets with a very low computational cost. To compare the effectiveness of our training data sets, we extract the intersection of our training data sets, which is data set B, and the target data set, which is data set A. The intersection of them is just the training data sets of interpolated based learning strategy. We call it data set C. We train two networks individually on dataset B and dataset C, 
and then test on dataset A. The testing result is exciting. Compared with the separated results using interpolated based learning scheme, results of our method are more close to the reference. It extracts most of the events, especially the waves with large amplitude. The continuity of waves is better, and the results look not that noisy. Here is from another perspective to evaluate the separation results. We apply reverse time migration to the separated PNS waves. PP images on the left reflect P wave quality, and PS images on the right reflect S waves quality. Also compared to the reference on the top, images using our method is better than the results from interpolated based learning. Most of the structure remains, and they are not be blurred by the separated arrows. The robustness of our training is also strong, in some extent. While training will make it convenient to not modify subsurface model but acquisition system, claiming that our data building strategy tolerates some small velocity errors. So how would results go when we add these errors into the subsurface model? Here we give out a new subsurface model and the difference between them with the original model of training dataset. The results refreshers. In general, separated results get worse, but not that worse as interpolated based learning. And what interested us is that it seems that all of the results of P wave are better than that of S waves. That may involve some intrinsic properties of P and S waves. So next step, we are going to examine why P-wave separation performs more robust than S-waves and make a closer step to apply what is inside data to few recorded data. That is all my presentation. Thanks for watching.